All right, so welcome everybody. This is the formal welcome. Um, I'm playing a couple of roles today, wearing two hats, uh, or maybe three. What's so your name? First, oh, my name's Nori Mazone. I'm the program coordinator for the Dementia Care Collaborative. Thanks, Susan. Um, so let's see, many of you know that I usually give the Zoom rundown and let everyone know what to do. So I'm gonna do that in a second, and I'm also moderating today's event. So, Zoom basics, you all got here, fantastic. Um, you should all be muted as you came in. If for some reason you accidentally unmute yourself, please mute yourself again. Um, uh, the spotlight will alternate between who is speaking. So even if you're on gallery view or speaker view, whoever is kind of has the floor will be spotlighted, which is me right now. Um, this event is being recorded. Uh, because then we, we do some editing and we host it on the website, the MGH Geriatric Medicine website. But do not worry, your face or your name will not appear on the recording. It'll just be the speakers, so you, there will be no record of you. Um, let's see. Um, we will be using the chat function at the bottom of the screen. It's right next to the share screen. So throughout the presentation, as Dr. Miguel Rivera is speaking, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat at any time. And I'll be moderating the chat box throughout. Just don't put any personal information or any medical information or anything that you don't want other people to know. Don't put it in there. Um, so those are kind of the logistics of Zoom. I would like to take a moment to introduce the Dementia Care Collaborative team. Um, let's see, I hope I get everybody. I'm, I'm gonna leave out titles. Susan Rowlett is here, Barbara Moskowitz is here, Judy Willett is here, Kelsey Anderson is here, Chris White is here, um, and they're our team of extraordinary social workers and project manager. So um, welcome them all. I am now gonna tell you a little bit about the Caregiver Support Program. So the Caregiver Support Program of the Dementia Care Collaborative was started at Mass General in 2017. And we are part of the Palliative Care and Geriatric Medicine Division. Um, and as many of you know, the mission of our program is uh, nothing big, just to transform memory care. Um, and we really exist at MGH to, to provide education, connection and support for patients, for caregivers, for clinicians, um, really for, for everyone. No one is excluded. Um, we offer care consultations to caregivers and patients in very specific MGH clinics. We offer skills classes for caregivers. We offer support groups and we offer health and resiliency programming, which is what today's offering is in that program. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but this program is 100% philanthropically supported. So that's why none of you have ever paid to come to any of these things. So if you are interested in supporting our program, please let me or any of our team members know um, and we can connect you to learning about how to give a gift. Um, so that's who we are and what we do. And we are always excited to bring new speakers to you. Um, today is Dr. Miguel Rivera. Some of you might have met him two weeks ago when he did the first part of this series. Um, so Miguel is an adult psychiatrist in private practice in Sarasota, Florida, and he is the medical director for Tri Yoga International. He speaks internationally on the influence of lifestyle in Alzheimer's and related disorders. And he comes to us today with extensive experience caring for people with memory disorders their family and paid providers, whether in a home or in a care facility. He has a very holistic approach that has significantly reduced the use of medications for mood and behavior problems. And he has equally improved quality of life for his patients and all of their caregivers. So I welcome Miguel. Thank you for being here again today. Thank you, Nori. Thank you, Susan, and everyone else from the Dementia Collaborative. I am so excited about being here today. So without any uh, delay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, here we go. So this is just a little 
um, little trial version of this talk. You know, the, the subject of, of stress is, is the voluminous. And um, so here, we're just going to basically get our feet wet in terms of introducing good stress and bad stress. And many of you, uh, perhaps two weeks ago, met my uncle Al here. And uh, he came back to remind us that we cannot solve problems using the same thinking that we used when we created them. So our journey today begins actually at Harvard. And um, in the year 2015, when Dr. Walter Cannon uh, discovered that there was a pretty predictable uh, system of physiologic changes that animals went through when they were experiencing pain, hunger, fear, or rage. And he called this the fight or flight response. And it is central to understanding the concept of stress. So in his words, taught to deal with concrete and demonstrable body bodily changes, we are likely to minimize or neglect the influence of an emotional upset, or to call the patient who complains of it neurotic, and perhaps tell him to go home and forget it, and then be indifferent to the consequences. But emotional upsets have concrete and demonstrable effects in the organism. And as we will see, they are quite significant. Interestingly, it was also at Harvard that about 52 years later, Dr. Herbert Benson discovered the opposite of the fight or flight response or the relaxation response, the rest and digest response. And in his words, the relaxation response is a physical state of deep rest that changes the physical and emotional responses to stress. And it is the opposite of the fight or flight response. So these live within our autonomic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system on the right is the origin or the system that supports the fight or flight response. It is an emergency situation, uh, preparing the body to either fight or to fly as quickly as possible to get away from the situation. And whether the fight or flight response is activated because we had an emotional upset because we fought with our partner or because we just ran into a tiger and they're about to eat us. The, our body reacts exactly the same way in predictable fashion. And part of what happens is uh, the pupil uh, is dilated, it inhibits salivation, it relaxes the bronchi, it increases the heart rate so that we can breathe more deeply and effectively. And it also inhibits digestive activity. Um, we will go through those uh, in more detail later. Um, the parasympathetic nervous system is the relaxation response or the rest and digest. And it also has pretty predictable components to it, such as the constriction of the pupil. It stimulates salivation, it constricts the bronchi, and it actually stimulates gastric activity. So focusing on the fight or flight response, the, the, one of the first things that happens when the fight or flight response is activated is that stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol um, begin to um, be more, more of them produced. And this results in combined effects of increasing the heart rate and blood pressure and increasing the respiratory rate. People experience shaking and sweating as well as muscle tension. It increases blood clotting in case we might run into one of those tiger teeth. Uh, it increases blood sugar so that the brain and the muscles have the fuel to fight or to get away as quickly as possible. And the digestion slows down or stops. It is uh, so frequent for me to see patients that come with significant abdominal complaints and they have gone to the GI doctor and they have been started on medications and different things to help them deal with their GI tract, but the origin was never the GI tract. The origin of their symptoms was the fact that they were going through a period uh, that was highly stressful in their lives. 
So luckily for us, you know, not all stress is bad. So on the left hand side, we have eustress, and this is the stress that is healthy, like the one that I've been feeling all morning in preparation to come here and share this information with you guys. Um, it, but it is the, the stress that gives a feeling of motivation and purpose and other positive feelings. It got me out of bed this morning early, uh, excited about the possibility of uh, uh, meeting with you and sharing some of uh, what I have learned. And, and you see our little ninja warrior here, he, he's, he's ready to go and excited about running through that uh, enormous pile of papers. Uh, however, on the other hand, here we have um, uh, our other friend who, who is actually having a completely different reaction. And, and that is something that we will talk about shortly. So this is more distress. So stress that has negative health implications. And in particular, what we are concerned about is this chronic uncontrolled distress. So stress that it is persistent, the chronic low-grade activation of the fight or flight response leads to a host of health problems such as increased inflammation and oxidative damage, depression, anxiety, compromised immunity, cognitive problems, including brain atrophy, and it can even affect the genes, our genes, which ones of those actually get transcribed. So this is a stress to performance chart. So if we begin here in, in the corner here, the stress level is very, very low and performance is also very low. So our friend Wally here is, is on the couch and he is, um, he's, he's dreaming about uh, entering that race, but oh, it's probably a few months out and he feels he doesn't really need to practice yet. So very little motivation. And uh, so he's taking a good nap there. Um, however, as the stress level increases, as we move in this direction and the stress level increases, then we see that performance also begins to increase. So we, we go from being bored or you know, too calm to our performance improving as the stress level increases. And you see the range of use stress as it, it is a, the optimal level of, of stress that gets our best performance. So without stress, we do, it does a, life does not get the best that we have to offer. Without stress, the brain atrophies, you know, one of the worst things that people can do um, is to retire. And so many of the uh, patients that I see with mild cognitive impairment uh, are recently retired. They have uh, recently kind of had a, a letdown in the things that they have to concentrate upon and pay attention to. And as the stress levels continue, however, to increase, then the performance begins to decrease uh, to the point where the, the stress can get so severe that you're kind of back on the couch. So with, with too little stress, uh, you're, you're on the couch because you're bored and have no motivation. And with uh, too much, uh, then you're distressed and, and exhausted and you can't move, so you're back on the couch. So the, the question is, how do we, optimize our stress? How can we reframe it in ways that it becomes helpful to us? So what are the symptoms of stress? Because just like all those patients that come to me with GI distress and they're not really suffering from uh, any kind of GI disease, it's mostly the effects of stress. So things like anxiety, of course, uh, but also depression, social isolation, fatigue and exhaustion, insomnia and anger and irritability, as well as things like headaches, uh, low back pain, digestive issues, like I just mentioned, cognitive problems, weight issues, and also major illnesses, like um, um, stress is a major risk factor for um, illnesses like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer. Now, one of the points I want to impress upon you is that our mental state is of paramount importance in terms of how we deal with stress. Because two people can, have, can be going through a similar experience and have completely different perceptions of stress. 
So here they're probably the dad and the daughter are looking at the same thing and the dad is smiling and the daughter is crying. And I will tell you that I have patients uh, in my service who uh, I've had people with cancers in, in the same unit and one of them, one of the patients cannot get out of bed, they're so depressed and another one is out making other people laugh. So our mental state is most important in developing resilience in terms of stress. So what are the things, what kind of things can we do to help ourselves cope better with stress, be able to understand it better and be able to manage it? So the first thing I wanna talk about is to be mindful about what we ingest. And not just what we ingest through our mouth, but what we feed the mind. And this is so important because the mind thinks about what you put in it. So today, because we're a little bit crunched for time, um, we are going to discuss a little bit about uh, our uh, sense of taste, our sense of vision, and our sense of hearing. So beginning with our taste and the things that we take in, during moments of stress or during periods of stress, our body depletes its stores of nutrients. So things like vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, proteins are all depleted and it ends, uh, that hypermetabolic state, it creates a state of increased free radical production as well as creating a demand for more water. Now, for most people, the idea that diet can be healing is just beginning to perhaps sink in. You know, I made it through four years of medical school and four years of psychiatric residency without having any meaningful lectures on nutrition, the role of nutrition in disease, in mental illness, and stress. It is something that I learned uh, from being in practice. And I am not here to uh, talk about any particular diet, but I am here to encourage you to make a conscious choice about the diet that you actually are using. Most people are kind of choosing on autopilot and they are on the diet that they inherited from their parents. What I am here to ask of you is to educate yourself to read about the Mediterranean diet, to read about the flexitarian diet, to read about the whole foods plant-based diet and see which one appeals most to you and see which one would be better for your particular situation. Because one thing we know for sure is that the Western diet is associated with poor health outcomes. We know that the Western diet is associated with cardiovascular disease, with cancer, with diabetes, with Alzheimer's disease with so many of the diseases that plague uh, our, our society. So whatever you do, just spend some time educating yourself about the different diets and make a conscious choice. The other thing we put in our mouths, or that you should be putting in, is uh, water. So the human body is about 60% water. Our blood is 75. I'm sorry, the brain is 75. The blood is 90 and bone even, 31% water. And just a 2% drop in water levels can contribute and make us feel like we're dehydrated. And what does that feel like? What are the signs and symptoms of mild dehydration? Number one, fatigue and tiredness, decreased urine output. You know, like we should be using the bathroom every hour or two. If that is not happening, you're probably not drinking enough. Dry eyes, muscle weakness, headaches, dizziness, muscle cramps, constipation, decreased concentration can all be issues that can be resolved by drinking more water. I combined the hearing and the vision because they kind of go hand in hand. Um, so one of the first things that I tell my stressed out patient is just please take a news holiday. Uh, unplug from the, the, the news, the endless news, the uh, you know, uh, online feeds, newspapers and magazines that uh, remind you uh, about uh, things that uh, distress you. Uh, watch less TV, watch better TV, you know, uh, take a course, 
uh, learn a language, um, you join an online class, uh, you join uh, Nori for her Ageless Grace, uh, uh, you know, program. Uh, watch TV that helps with stress, uh, not that makes it worse. Uh, keep your conversations positive. Uh, talk about the things that help, uh, not about uh, how bad things are. Uh, keep, keep good company, you know, uh, our friends and the people that, um, that uh, hang out with us, those who we choose to spend time with, uh, they influence uh, very much how we feel uh, day to day. Uh, spend some time uncluttering your space. When our eyes see a space that is uh, clean and organized, uh, there is a sense of uh, peace and calm that is associated with that. Uh, learn something new. Um, this experience that you are going through or that we may be going through that is stressful, how can we turn that around? How can you make that experience into an opportunity for growth, into an opportunity to learn something new about yourself, to discover uh, how good you can be, how, how effective you can be, how you can maybe become an inspiration for someone else? Um, you know, like... Uh, I've learned to use these computer programs in a more significant way so that my presentations are a little bit better. Uh, how to become a more effective speaker, how to um, polish skills that can help me share the message. And anything at all that you go through that you overcome or that you learn to deal with can be a source of inspiration for other people. Um, other things that we can do is, of course, to read. Um, music is one of the um, most healing modalities that we have. It, it stimulates the brain. It, 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 it improves memory. It lowers stress hormones. Um, I think it's, uh, I can't imagine my life without music. And I, I use it in my facilities. We use it during uh, bathing for the demented patients. We use them during meal times. Uh, music is uh, indeed something magic. Um, and also the backdrop of music, which is the silence under which uh, all sounds are yeah, superimposed. Uh, if even just a few minutes of silence every day can be highly uh, rejuvenating and healing for the mind and the body. And uh, lastly, um, if we have time, we're going to, I have a, a slide on nature, but uh, and just in case, if you know, make sure you get out every day and get some sunshine and fresh air, uh, have an opportunity to be around the trees. It is uh, highly healing. It, it short circuits the fight or flight response. It improves our immunity. Um, and, and if you cannot go out into nature, bring it inside, get plants and, um, and, and make your house into a greenscape. There we go. So how is it that we put things in the mind? Like I've just been telling you, be mindful about what you ingest. How do we ingest? We begin by paying attention. And this is so important, the, the most important uh, concept for today. How many of us have had the experience of getting home and having no idea how we got there? We left work and all of a sudden we're home and we passed streets and cars and people and they never became part of our reality. We were so much in our mind that we neglected to see everything else. And the reason for that is that before anything can be real to us, before anything can be processed and become a part of our experience, we need to pay attention to it. It is like the gatekeeper. Attention is what steers our perceptions. We see, hear that which we are paying attention to. Because it is what we, because due to attention, things become real to us. It is what controls our reality. It is the gateway of the mind. So in that way, what is it that we are really paying attention to? Recognizing that if you pay attention, attention to stress-inducing things, that will become your reality. If you pay attention to things that are more positive, endearing, expansive, you will also feel that way. 
be selective about what you put in. Be selective about how you manage and focus your attention. Now, this is a study that was published in the journal Science in 2010. And it, is, it, taught, it, it, it studied the opposite of paying attention, which is wandering mind, to be distracted, uh, to space out about other things. And it has some pretty interesting findings. So they begin by saying that unlike other animals, human beings spend a lot of time thinking about what is not going on around them. Contemplating events that happened in the past, might happen in the future, or may not happen at all. Indeed, this stimulus-independent thought or mind-wandering appears to be the default network of operation. Please, when you get home and you have some time, um, look up the brain default network, and you will find some really interesting information there. Okay, so what did they find? So number one, people's minds wandered frequently, regardless of what they were doing. So mind wandering occurred in 46.9% of the samples, meaning that people spent almost 50% of their time thinking about things other than they're doing. And how did they find this? So what they did was this, they gave people iPhones. And they did what is called experience sampling. So what they did was that they asked, they, they, they gave people iPhones and then they asked them, they called them several times a day and they asked, what are you doing? How are you feeling? And what were you thinking about? So the next thing they found, what they found was that people were less happy when their minds were wandering than when they were not. And this was true for all activities, even the least enjoyable. Now that is a big one. What this means is that as long as you stay focused on the task at hand, you will feel better than doing anything else, regardless if what you're doing is something that is taking some effort or is something that is challenging or difficult. What is most important is to keep our awareness and the focus on that which we are doing in not letting the mind to wander. So although people's minds were more likely to wander to pleasant topics than to unpleasant topics or neutral ones, people were no happier when thinking about pleasant topics than their current activity, regardless of what that was. And yet we're considerably unhappier when thinking about neutral topics, like, oh, I got to go to the store, or I got to do this. As long as people's mind were wandering, they felt worse. And last but not least, what people were thinking was a better predictor of their happiness than what it was that they were doing. So your thoughts, what you pay attention to, is a greater indicator of your happiness than the things that are going on in your life. So no matter what you're experiencing, you can begin to fix it right now by beginning to manage your attention, by recognizing how important it is to stay in this moment. So attention. Mindfulness is another word for attention. It's often spoken of as the heart of Buddhist meditation. But it's not about Buddhism at all. It is about paying attention. That's what meditation is. No matter what tradition or particular technique is used. So whether you're doing walking meditation, mantra meditation, whether you're uh, watching your breath, whatever it is that may be happening. It, it is still, regardless of what is it that you're paying attention to, it is still that you're paying attention to something. So purposely redirecting our attention to the present moment 
without judgment, with openness, acceptance, and compassion. So I want to show you here the benefits of mindfulness meditation, not to necessarily go through them, but to impress upon you that the data in support of mindfulness continues to grow. And it's like an endless uh, list of things that mindfulness can improve. Yet, this is not some expensive new treatment or a brand new medicine that, can, that has all these health benefits. This is just a management of our attention. Whenever we do that, it eases symptoms of mental distress, improves self-esteem, decreases cravings, improves heart disease, improves our sleep, decreases pain, and it increases our overall quality of life. Just to pay attention does all that. In one of the ways, one of the most effective ways of harnessing our attention is through breath awareness. When we breathe, it stimulates our attention through a place in the brain called the locus ceruleus. When we begin to pay, to be mindful of our breath, more norepinephrine gets made. That norepi improves our focus and concentration, which deepens our breath, which improves our concentration, which deepens our breath. So it's like a cycle that happens as soon as we begin to become mindful of our breathing. Our breath decreases the fight or flight response. It creates mental and physical relaxation. It reduces anxiety and improves mood. It lowers blood pressure, stabilizes oxygen, improves sleep, redu reduces impulsivity, anger, and cravings, and it helps us in regulating our emotions. Now, these are the things that we're going to practice later on today in our more experiential part of the program. But I wanted just to impress upon you again that the breathing is directly linked to our emotions. Um, so here it is, emotions are linked to respiration. Every emotion that we have has a particular breathing pattern that is associated with it. And in this particular study uh, that was published in 1991 in the International Journal of Psychophysiology, what they looked at were these, what they called prototypical respiratory, facial, and postural actions, or the, what they called em emotional effector patterns. So what they said was that whenever we experience an emotion, three things happen. Our breath changes accordingly, our facial expression changes accordingly, and our posture. So we experience the emotion and then top down, it affects our breath, it affects our facial expression, and it affects our posture. So what they did in this study was that they trained people to do it bottom up. So they trained people to improve their posture, change their facial expression, adjust their breathing, and they were able to generate these emotions. So we will do it later today, but the study basically concluded that there were well differentiated sets of respiratory changes that characterized each of the six basic emotions, happiness, sadness, anger, fear, etc. And that if you change your posture, if you change your facial expression and you change your breathing pattern, you can change the way that you feel. And this is the first, uh, the last one from the first part. If I have a little bit of extra time, we can go through the other ones. But physical activity. Culver Bailey said that if we could take exercise and put it in a pill, it would be the most prescribed medication in the world. But the trick is that it takes one hour to swallow this pill. <laughs> so the health benefits of physical activity are endless whether it's walking or yoga, meditation, tennis, dancing, whatever your favorite physical activity is, just do it. It, it helps to reduce stress, it'll improve mood, decrease anxiety, improve immunity, reduce the risk of cancer. It, it really is great, uh, great medicine. And I want to here mention once again that Nori has the program of Ageless Grace, and I really, really encourage you to do it. It is really fun, 
it's physical activity to upbeat music. And uh, Susan sent me a video of Nori doing it and I, I followed her and I, it was just really fun. Miguel, so thank you for the plug. And I just wanted to say, great segue. So thank you. And, but we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to move a little bit along to get to our experiential part of the program. Thank okay. you. <laughs> do, how much time do I have, if any? Um, well, there's 20 minutes and we'd love you to do experiential for 10 or 15 and then questions for just okay. about five. All right, so then we can just stop it right here. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Um, so yeah, if you want to move to the experiential part of the program, that would be fantastic. Okay, so. Thanks, Miguel. Uh, certainly. So I just want you to take a second and, and think about this. You know, what, uh, what is our emotional effect or pattern when we are feeling upset or defeated or embarrassed? What is it that happens? It's fairly predictable. Uh, we close off our heart. We, we slouch, our shoulders roll down and forward. Follow me with this. Uh, don't worry, there's no one who can see you. <laughs> so just uh, hide your heart, uh, roll your spine, uh, slouch a little bit, let your shoulders come forward, and, and just take a second to see how that, what that feels like. And, um, you know, it's, I mean, to me, I just, I feel like a certain, some degree of constriction, it makes it kind of more difficult to breathe. It, it's, it's kind of a constricted, unhappy state. So now just kind of bring your attention to the seat of your pants, to your, your hips, to the sacrum. And then from there, just begin to lengthen from the base up, just lengthening your spine. And then allow your shoulders to roll back and down. Just straighten out our posture. Look, it, it feels like there's a sense of openness and it's so much easier to breathe. Now close your eyes and take a second and, and notice the difference just from changing our posture. What difference it makes just by sitting up straight. How many times do we hear that from our parents or teachers? Hey, sit up straight. It does, it works wonders. Um, if you're finding yourself not feeling good, first thing to ask, how is my posture? Now, second, notice your facial expression. And then take a second to see how that feels like. And as you are experiencing that, then bring to your awareness, like your favorite puppy or kitty cat or your favorite person or your favorite friend, your favorite situation that can bring a smile to your face, a, that feeling of happiness, of enjoyment, allow that to show through in the way that your facial expression is taking. Then allow your awareness to notice what your breath is doing. This is the third component. Our spine is straight, our shoulders are back and down, our chest is open, we are welcoming, we are receiving, we are okay with this moment. We, we are not judging it, we are open with compassion for ourselves and for what we are experiencing, whatever it is that, that may be. And just see, where, where is my breath going? Am I just kind of breathing on the top of my lungs? And if that is the case, just just apply your mind to it and bring the breath to the base of the lungs. Just little by little begin to lengthen both the inhale and the exhale. And if your mind begins to wander, just no problem, just bring it back. And, and if it begins to, if it wanders again, just note it. Note, what am, what am I thinking about? What, what is distracting me? And then bring yourself back to this moment. This is the exercise. This is the, this is the key. This, these are the repetitions for the mind. Bringing yourself over and over again to the experience of this moment. So now let's begin to put a little bit of control over our breath. 
So notice how long is your inhale. Let's say you're inhaling for three seconds, then maybe hold for one second, and then exhale for three, and then hold for one. So three second inhale, hold for one, and then exhale for another three count. And then hold the exhale out for a count. Now let's try four seconds. So inhale for four. Hold for one. Exhale for four. Inhale for four. Hold for one. And now let's just lengthen the exhale a little bit. Exhale for six. Inhale for four. Hold for one. Exhale for six. Again, if your mind begins to wander, just gently bring it back to the feeling of your lengthening spine of your relaxed shoulders, of your pleasant facial expression, and the rhythm of your breath. Just notice how you feel, notice the energy. We all have a vibration, the sum total of our thoughts, of our emotions, of everything we've done and experienced resonates within us. Become familiar with that feeling. And notice how you can change it, how you can affect it by doing something like what we're doing right now. So let's lengthen the exhale now a little bit more. So in your next inhale, inhale for four, hold for two, exhale for eight. And repeat. Inhale for four. Hold for two. And exhale for eight. And if you cannot quite get to eight, it's okay. Do six. Just do what feels comfortable. We don't want to add any distress. We don't want to add any stress. We want to feel how it feels to be relaxed. Practice every day the way you want to feel. If you want to feel relaxed and peaceful, practice it every day. Everything takes practice. If you want to get better at tennis, you need to play tennis. If you want to get better at yoga, you have to practice yoga. If you want to write, you need to practice writing. Feeling in a particular way is no different. So what do we practice day in and day out? What emotions and patterns are we constantly repeating in our mind? Are they helpful to us? If they are not, then introduce new thoughts, new patterns, new ways of feeling, new ways of relating to our existence here. Focusing our attention. And again, four second inhale, two second hold, six or eight second exhale. Now we're just going to stop there and but keep your eyes closed and just take some internal inventory. You know, this was not a lengthy practice. It was just a few minutes. Do you feel any different? If you do, this is something, it's totally free. You can practice it anywhere you're at, you, you're at whether you're at work or whether you're home. Uh, you can definitely pay attention to your posture. You can pay attention to your facial expression. 
and you can pay attention to your breath. And whenever you are ready, I will happily take some questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Miguel, for leading us in that um, brief meditation. Um, so if anyone would like to ask any questions or if anybody has any comments, um, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Someone says priceless. Um, right. Thank you. <laughs> um, so if anybody has experience with, you know, that they'd want to share from this practice that we just did, or maybe you've, you've given this um, a go in your own life at another time, or you do have a meditation practice or, you know, a skill that you use as a caregiver, you know, we call this caregiver rescue. Um, if there's any experience that you'd like to share with, with the group of how maybe this has helped you in the past. Um, ah, yes, Miguel, can you stop sharing your slides? <laughs> Thanks, Judy. And we can Certainly. all just see each other. Yeah. Thank you. So we're not just little boxes. Okay, I will stop sharing. There we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So yeah, if anybody has any questions about um, the fight or flight response, the parasympathetic nervous system, what this feels like in our bodies, any questions or comments? And yes, we will, um, we will be hosting this video on our, on the website in probably in about a week or two. Um, Miguel, I'll yes. actually uh, ask it, <laughs> uh, but you, other people ask or just chat in. Um, if someone is having feelings, if they're noticing that their memory is not as good as it used to be, and that causes anxiety and stress because you're trying to remember it, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about an approach that might um, help them to remember or whatever would be a more positive response when you can't remember your friend's name who you've known for a long time or, you know, that feeling? Well, you know, I, I think the first thing that comes to mind is uh, share that with your doctor um, because, um, you know, things are much easier to uh, fix or help if they're cut early. So if you're beginning to, you know, if you're in your, you know, 50s or 60s and you're beginning to, uh, uh, you know, have some kind of cognitive problems, I would recommend to see your doctor right away you know you may have b12 deficiency or something like that or something that can, it can be a medication like we discussed two weeks ago um but in terms of of stress um if you know that stress is an issue and if you know that the fact that you're having memory problems is making you stressful um then engage in doing some of the things that we talked about you know, physical activity, be mindful about what you eat and put in there, uh, you know, uh, go on a walk every day, be out in nature, uh, you know, do things that uh, will help you to manage your stress. And, and of course, you know, to have the awareness and the understanding that when, you know, when we do get nervous, we don't think as clearly. Uh, and, and that happens across the board, you know, when, when someone is is nervous or, or uh, concerned about things, they may forget things that they really know well. So I would just say, you know, practice. If, if, uh, if you're feeling anxious on a regular basis, it'd be a good idea to begin to create a program uh, that works for you. Uh, you know, again, whether it's walking or music or taking a, an online course or learning a new language. I mean, so many things that we can do uh, to help ourselves. Um, with uh, issues like that. Hope that answers your question. Um, Miguel, this is Susan. Would you yeah. say that um, it's help, it might be a helpful idea for those who are caring for someone with dementia that I'm just imagining practicing breathing, just like we did together, 
even in the presence of the person with dementia, might help to calm. Do you get, you know what I'm getting at? The, like if we're calming, it may help the person with dementia feel more calm? For sure. I, you know, Susan, I, it's one of the things that I am so uh, aware of, and, and that is that my energy precedes me. Mm. And that if I really want to have a good interaction with someone who has dementia, um, there is a lot of nonverbal communication that happens with demented patients where a touch or the inflection of your voice or the kindness which we, with which you speak, it gets, it gets transmitted. So I am constantly trying to be mindful of my breath, in particular when I am seeing patients. I mean, I try to be mindful when I'm doing the dishes, you know, when I'm driving in my car, when I, I'm going out for a walk, I am trying to keep that rhythm of the breath going. But in particular, in situations um, where I am more apt perhaps to be anxious or to experience a little bit of stress or anxiety, particularly during those times, and particularly when I see my patients with dementia, I, I make it a point to be mindful and to be in the moment when I see them. And the breath is one of the great anchors to mindfulness and to being in this moment. So. Yes, for sure. It just, it just reminds me of, and I'll, um, I just want to make this comment that I've spoken to so many caregivers about practicing um, before you go into the house or before you go into the room to take 10 seconds or on the pathway. If you have, uh, you know, a path to the door, if you've come home from the grocery store and you make that a transition period where you really are mindful of your breath so that when you enter, you're a little more calm maybe than you were when you were in the traffic and driving. It makes makes good sense to do that, Susan, to take take some time to tune in and to get yourself peaceful and calm before you try to help somebody else. Easier said than done, but it's a great practice. Well, you know, if, for sure, you know, I mean, listen, we, um, we, we live in time space, you know, and in time, uh, everything changes. Uh, things are in a constant state of flux. And, and human beings, we, we love for things to stay the same. Yet we uh, changes the 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 uh, the order of the day. So uh, we should become like champions of change, you know. And uh, and to know that it's good to take a few minutes and tune in, even if something happened that derailed you, you know, or you know something happened, somebody cut you off in traffic, or there was a traffic jam, or you know whatever it is that it may be. To know that to have the awareness that it's good to take a little bit of time to get yourself better composed before you do things. I think that that is like such a um, wonderful and effective thing to do for sure. Miguel, we have one, we have, let's see, we've got four minutes and we have one question in the chat box. So okay. Susan, thank you. I think that, yeah, that topic of co-regulation is so important. So this is, we have a question. Um, Sometimes MCI progresses to dementia. Sometimes it can be lessened or cured by finding underlying medical conditions or mismatched, mismatched medications. Beyond those examples, do you see these techniques lessening the progression of MCI? Of mild cognitive impairment? Um, yes, I do. And you know, the data is supportive of that. You know, um, I actually, you know, I, I, hopefully you would intervene even before MCI, but if you, um, if you change your lifestyle, I mean, you know, the data is strong suggesting that if you address your stress, if you change your diet, if you begin to exercise, if you keep the mind stimulated, you know, if you try to learn new things, that you can reverse uh, a mild cognitive impairment and keep it from from progressing. I think that the data is supportive of that, uh, you know, um, but you know, it's not just with, with dementia, it's so for cardiovascular disease, for diabetes, you know, for so many of the other, you know, more chronic diseases that we have in our society today. If you catch it early and you bring about healthy lifestyle interventions, you can make a big difference there. And, and particularly, you know, MCI is also linked to cardiovascular disease. I gave a talk a, a couple of weeks ago for an MCI group, 
And just to drive the point home, I asked them, you know, who are the patients here that have MCI? Raise your right hand. And I said, you know, if you have a cardiologist, raise your left hand. And every single one of the persons with MCI had cardiovascular disease. They were seeing a cardiologist. And we know that cardiovascular disease is really responsive to a better diet, to exercise, to stress reduction. We know that we can reverse cardiovascular disease. We have the work of Dr. Coldwell Esselstyn um, and, and Dr. Dean Ornish that uh, have shown us that this can be reversed. And if you take care of your cardiovascular disease, it also uh, helps to slow down progression into Alzheimer's. So these, you know, cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's are like to hang out together. So yeah, lifestyle interventions can really make a difference. Thank you. Well, I'm noticing it's, it's one minute left. So um, thank you everybody for your questions and your comments. Uh, Miguel, thank you for this great presentation. Um, thank all of my colleagues in the Dementia Care Collaborative. So I just wanna say um, that our next event that we've got coming up um, is on October 20th. That's our Conversations with Caregivers. And that's gonna be with Dr. Olivia Okereke and Dr. Christine Ritchie. And they are gonna be discussing creative coping for older adults during COVID. Um, there might be another Health and Resiliency uh, Thursday event before that, which we will let you know about. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, lifestyle interventions um, to keep us health and resilient, to take care of ourselves and to be caregivers, to fill our own well um, for all the people that we're caring for. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. And this recording will be edited and it will be hosted on the website in about seven to 10 business days. And on the next email, I'll let you know when it's, when it's up. So thank you so much, um, Miguel, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rivera, so much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for inviting me.